so glad that you all are here. Uh, and I hope you all are having a great day. Before we get started, I have a few announcements for you. Number one, um, Vespers Mountaintop Worship is this Sunday, October 22nd. It is at 6 p.m. at Beauty Spot. If you've been to Mountaintop Worship before and enjoyed it, or would recommend later in hand, show of hands. Yes, look, look at those people. Go talk to them if you, if you want to go. You should show up. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll be there. Um, and then number two, next week is Homecoming Week. SGA will be putting on events every night next week. We'll have a movie night and breakfast at night, midnight dodgeball. There's going to be a lot of fun stuff happening, so check Instagram, the SGA Instagram for more information on that. Check your emails, you should get an email about those events. And those are events, so be at Mountain Top Worship. You can check Instagram for details on that and come to Homecoming events next week. Uh, thank you all for being here, and before we get started, I will pray for us. God, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to come together and worship you. Um, thank you for bringing all of these people together in this room, and I pray that you bring healing to each and every person here who, who needs it, and around the world, you bring healing, restoration, um, especially to those um, in Israel and Palestine who are facing conflict right now. Um, God, thank you for this day, and thank you for all the people who gathered here to worship you in the band, and all you've got to speak. Uh, we just pray that you work through them um, in everything that they, they play and sing and say today, uh, all for your glory. Amen. Well, good morning, friends. Stand and see together.
today, Marley Haskins. Marley has been my roommate since freshman year, which is like four years ago, and makes me feel old, and it's okay. <laughs> and she's shown me nothing but kindness and grace. If you know Marley, you know that she is such a caring friend, passionate about her views, and she lights up anyone's day when you talk to her. And I have no doubt that she is going to give a great message today. Without further ado, help me welcome Marley Haskins. He's described as being righteous, 
but he is in the place of the context of oppression and disillusionment. The Romans have conquered these people, and the promises that God made to them have either gone unfulfilled or forgotten entirely. Maybe both. On top of that, Sephiroth and his wife have not had any children, something that in their society is seen as both a duty and a celebration. He is righteous, but he has no hope. He's simply going through emotions. And it's in the middle of this that we find him in verse 11 of chapter 1. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear your son, and you are to call him John. And if you seek a dead giveaway answer to what despair looks like, may I present to you Zechariah's response? Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? How can I have confidence in this? What assurances can you give me? After all, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens, because you do not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Despair is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It starts by getting us to doubt the presence of God in the world, makes us question the work of God in our own lives. And if God is not active, if God is not working, then what assurance is there to be found in any future? We're lulled into a sense of complacency, robbing us of any preparation we may have had to join into God's story. We end up refusing to become a part of it, because we believe we cannot. And the warning of Zechariah is that this can happen to any of us, even the most righteous of the priests. So what's the contrast? The contrast is a commoner, a peasant teenage girl living in a small Galilean town. We can read about her a little bit further down in Luke 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And notice the shift here. The contrast between Mary's response to this and Zacharias, which we just saw. How will this be? Mary asks the angel. Since I am a virgin. How will this be? Not how can I be sure, not what assurances do you have? How will this be? Mary's question is in the means, but never in the God behind them. Her assurance is rooted in the constant and unchanging faithfulness of God. The God who took a trickster named Jacob, watched over him, and shaped him into a father of many nations. The God who took a shepherd named David and raised him up to be king over a united people. It is these examples of faithfulness that Mary is reminded of in this instance. And they only point to even more examples of God's faithfulness throughout the scriptures. There are so many stories like this. And the only thing that any of them have in common is that God's word is accomplished. God is faithful. Mary remembers this in this moment. That God is one whom we can put our hope in. And this only becomes more evidence during the rest of our conversation with the angel. 
Reading on, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. See, Mary has hope because she expects God to do what God did in the past again. She has hope because of the example that has been left of God's dependability and dedication. And in anchoring herself to that, she has learned how to cultivate the abundance of hope. There are two primary things that Mary does which help her to do this. The first is that she shifts her focus from her present circumstances up to God. And the second is that she surrounds herself with people of hope. And through these methods, she teaches us that hope not only opens our eyes to see the way that God is working in the world, it also invites us into that work. Because the other side of hope is that it does not allow us to remain stagnant. There's an expectancy to hope that spurs action. See, if you find yourself with the assurance and the confidence enough to have hope in the future, then that also tends to come with it, the energy and the passion and the excitement to work towards that future yourself. You find yourself wanting to nurture faith, the foundation upon which hope stands. You find yourself wishing for the eyes to see the way that God is working in the world. And you also find their invitation, calling you into that work, calling you to bring all your gifts and all your pain, all your joys and your doubts and your frustrations, and become an agent of hope in an otherwise despairing world. But what comes with that charge is it's incomparable. It's a hope. Real, authentic hope. Hope that will not leave let you down. Hope that's not flimsy or baseless. Hope that has an unshakable foundation to stand on in the faithfulness of God. So in the time I have left, I want to get super practical. I want to talk a little bit more through the two ways that Mary uses to cultivate this kind of hope. I know I mentioned briefly before that there are really things we cannot afford to miss. And the first one is this. Set your sights on God, not your circumstances. I don't know what you're going through right now. And to say that I did would be a lie. But I do know that suffering and pain are something that every human being has to there is no escape from it in this world. And if your gaze is always focused on those things, on what's gone wrong or going wrong or will be going wrong in the near future, you will never find firm footing. There is no constancy or dependability to be found in your circumstances. And if I'm the first person you're learning this from, you have a really good life. No, it can only be found when your gaze is shifted from your circumstances to the one who is above them all. Paul finds himself in one of these situations, when it seems like everything is going to go wrong. And I certainly don't want the context of what I'm about to read to you be lost here. The reason we have this account, this writing, this letter from Paul, is because he thought he was so dire he might die, and he wanted to let the church know what had happened. This is in the letter to the church in Corinth. We can find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt as if we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope, and that he will continue to deliver us as you help us rise. 
your prayers. The many who give thanks on our behalf to the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of men. But Mary and Paul's example, in all circumstances, good and bad, is to set their hope on God. And it's one we can learn from too. Because when we focus on God rather than our circumstances, we're focusing on what brings life and assurance into hope, not what steals it away. The second thing to attach to yourself to is people and communities of hope. We hear a lot in Christian circles that faith is an old person's sport. Neither is hope. Do you want to know what the first thing that Mary does after she hears this message from the angel? She goes to her cousin. She finds a community of hope right there with Elizabeth. And Elizabeth uplifts her and encourages her and gives her this wonderful blessing in verse 45. Blessed is she who believes that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she who believes. Blessed is she who persists in hope. Some of you might have been trying to go alone. You think all you need to do to be more hopeful is to wake up on the right side of the bed, just grit your teeth and say, today I'm going to be more hopeful. <coughs> and that lasts as long as it takes for something to go wrong. And then it all falls apart. We all need anchors in those times. Those times where everything just seems to be going wrong and it doesn't feel like there is hope. We need people who will tell us the truth and give us hope when we ourselves have none. And if you don't have an Elizabeth in your life, find one. Get plugged in. Find yourself someone you know who has this kind of enduring hope and ask them to share it with you. Because when we attach ourselves to communities of hope, we find a witness to the hope of God when ours alone falls short. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I found at least in my life that I'm really tired of being let down by the hope that this world has for me. It's temperamental, it's inconsistent, it never lasts long enough to amount to anything. It just, it feels a lot more like despair than it does hope. And if the witness of scripture is to be believed, which I do and I, I hope you do too, then there's only two places we can find to nurture a different kind of hope. That's in the faithfulness of God and the witness of God's people who have placed their hope in him. It's a hope that not only lets us see the way that God's working in the world, gives us new eyes to see, but it also is a calling an invitation that we might enter into that world as well. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for the example of Mary in your scriptures. I thank you that you have given us an example of hope. I thank you that you are not content to just leave us in this world without hope or guidance or direction, but that you were willing to do anything to give us our hope again, even at the cost of your son. I ask that you would help us as we try to nurture this kind of hope. Be with us in this week. Be with us for the rest of the semester. It's in your heavenly name that I pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand in this one. There they go. Yeah. Back to work.